Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV and shows will be sporadic over the next few days because if you hadn't noticed it's the D-Day anniversary popping up again and of course I have commitments here and there and everywhere uh, so I'll be doing that kind of thing but in the meantime we have a show today and hopefully it'll be one on Friday, uh, we'll see. Joining me today is um, uh, a former a Marine, a police officer, author and veterans advocate Andrew Biggio whose two books about an M1 rifle have proved very popular and people are already in the comments saying how great they are. This is the, the first one I haven't got the second one yet i'll bring andy in now um and we'll have a bit of a chat so um good afternoon andy how are you today paul thanks for having me um wish i could be in normandy this year i can't make it every anniversary so thanks for having me. i feel like i'm there being on the show no it's great so i mean you've done so many things we can you know this is gonna be a sprawling conversation but you know you, you you've got a service background you've you've now written these two books you take veterans back to europe you do veterans projects there in the USA, you, you bring together World War II veterans with more recently serving veterans. You, of course, are serving police officers as well. So there's that, that aspect as well. Just uh, of, apart from your, your career, where did the interest in bringing World War II into your life come from? You know, I, I, as a child, um, and I, I just love, I love being on these podcasts because it makes me think of uh, how happy I am to be where I am today. But I want to say like the, the early ages of a, of a kid just seeing the World War II veterans selling poppies outside the local convenience stores or the supermarkets, something about the ribbons on their hats. And, you know, I, I couldn't have been older than eight or nine and, and seeing them in the parades and wanting to play hide and go seek and, and taking tree tree branches and using them as fake guns in, in the neighborhood. And it started there. And um I think as I got older, I realized that both of my grandfathers had each lost a brother in World War II. Um, so my mom, my my grandfather, Masmeno Del Rossi, who was wounded in Bastogne with the 10th Armored Division, his brother, John, was killed in the Philippines. Then my grandfather, John Biggio, on my dad's side's brother, Andrew Biggio, was killed in Italy with the 34th Division. So I had two Gold Star grandfathers, and we were taught uh, sacrifice at a young age in, in my family. <clears throat> Well, I mean, that's that, that's a great story to start with. And just for the record, I was thrown out of, or my parents got called into what you would call kindergarten, what we called in the UK playgroup when I was about four, for making um, uh, rifles out of Lego. Basically anything that, that I could make into the shape of a gun, I would. And I always wanted to play World War II in the garden. And it's interesting, it's come up so often on World War II TV. There's a whole generation of British World War II historians who are within about five or six years, about the same age, James Holland, Alex, Alex Kershaw, me. And it's because we had these childhood where we all played World War II in the garden. My parents' generation played cowboys and Indians and later generations played, played I don't know, Spider-Man and Star Wars. But my yeah. generation was, was World War II. And uh, that's where it all came from. But the rifle, the you know, the second volume of the book now, that that's been a, an extraordinary success story because you know you you're you're not a um you didn't come from a circuit of 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 military societies and a speaking background. You you know you'd served and you've you know you've got your degree in history, you've done all that. But suddenly to get your first book to 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 go explode explosive as it was 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 so so good. So how did it start? Was it was it something you kind of planned, or was it a random thing that this it, it became something out of nothing? Totally random. Um, didn't even enjoy writing in college, writing in school. Um, couldn't wait to get out of college and school. I was more of a hands-on guy. It's kind of why I wanted to go right to the police force or the Marine Corps. And, and um, I think my own survivor's guilt got in the way of that. So I think sometimes your passion will trump your education level or your passion will trump your, uh, your, your design background, I guess. Um, when I got home from Afghanistan and Iraq, um, uh, it always affected me about not getting wounded and meeting so many guys with these devastating injuries that, um, that we've never seen the survivability of ever in history because of the advancements in technology, the advancements mm -hmm. in evacuating some of the battlefield within minutes. Um, we've never seen these devastating injuries where you can survive from the belly button down gone. You can have a bicranial replacement surgery. And um, in Massachusetts, what we do for the killed in action from World War One until present day is we name the intersections of roads after them. Right down the street from my house is Andrew Biggio Square. 
The next street over is Joe Madonna Square from the 101st Airborne. The next street after that's Ralph Cunningham, KIA Normandy. So, but every day going past your own sign with your own name on it kind of is a screw game in your head. Like yeah. what happened to that Andrew Biggio that didn't happen to this Andrew Biggio? Mm-hmm. Why did he die and I lived? Why did, was he 19, never got to have a family and have a, a wife, maybe even a serious girlfriend, drink beer? Why did he get killed in those hills in Italy? And what happened that day? And so going by that street sign every day, I think with my own survivor's guilt, I started to feel bad for that Andrew, even though we didn't say serve in the same wars. I started to feel tremendously awful about um, this 19-year-old kid who never got to start his life. And and also the fact that how many more 19-year-olds in this country whose name we'll never know, these little intersection street signs that we pass by every day of them being forgotten. And um, my grandmother had told me she had kept all of Andrew Vigio's letters that he wrote home before he was killed, Paul. Wow. And the first letter I take out of the shoebox under her bed was... Dear mom, today we fired the M1 Grand Rifle. It is the best rifle of that time. Because right now he's just in basic training. He's like, this rifle is going to be better than the Japanese, the Germans. It holds eight rounds. It's accurate. He didn't know where he was going to end up. But here he is, you know, telling his mother about this rifle. You know, I mean, it's so funny because you would think that would be such a guy topic. But and we always say that the military makes a man out of you and you're going to get toughened up. But I can't tell you how many veterans who their best friend in their letters home were their mom. And um, and I always add this important detail of those letters. The letters got so sad and so depressing as I pulled them out of the shoebox. Dear mom, I guess it's not a breach of security to tell you that I'm now in North Africa. Dear mom, I'm in Italy and the fo- and what it looks like here are pictures from the first war. Dear mom, the Germans are surrendering in droves. Sometimes we find Russian cartridges. You know, it looks like Russia's going to win this war. Then the last letter was September 12th, 1944. Andrew would be killed September 17th, 1944, just outside of Florence. Uh, the town's called Barbarino. And he said, uh, and, and every person in this country should read this letter. <clears throat> it says, dear mom, will you mail me a gold cross? I don't want to go back up this hill again. They're making us go back up this hill tomorrow. Can you send me a gold cross to wear around my neck? I mean, he knew that letter wasn't going to get to his mother for at least a month. And Mm -hmm. um, he was killed four days later and and up on up in the mountains there. I mean, half of B Company 135th Regiment uh, really gave their lives on the Gothic line. Oh, I mean, and and you know, you're, you're right. A lot of us. Our, our interest and our way of remembering is through those that didn't survive. You know, the cemeteries are, I'm not going to say they're an easy place to visit, but you can go in Europe or you can go to one of the States and you can go there and you can pay your respects to those who who, who didn't, as you say, who didn't live to, to, to beyond the war, who died in their youth and didn't get a chance to marry. But I think it's the veterans who, who did survive, who had the slow, torturous, um, death if you like in the uh, for, for some of the guys you spoke to and i've spoken to their their torment lasted 50 60 70 years and i think it's 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 quite easy for us to kind of you know we see it in normandy you see it in baston you see people come to normandy on their on their day trip from paris or whatever and they go at a cemetery and they spend a few minutes thinking about those who found we had memorial weekend of course but reaching out to veterans around you involves a hell of a lot more effort and groundwork and long-term commitments people like yourself who bring veterans back and donnie edwards bringing veterans back it's not just a trip you do with them it's the fact you've got to be in contact with these guys forever now you can't bring them into your world and then say okay you've had a trip now bye you've then got to watch them age you've got to watch them die and and i think that that aspect of, of working as you do and not just with world war ii veterans i want to talk to you a bit about you're bringing together World War II veterans with younger veterans and how how that works and whether there's you know, where do they share common ground and where do they where where the differences go. So, well, let's talk about that now, because to talk about some of that without sort of putting you on the spot and making you sort of, you know, show off, you do an incredible amount of work. So run through a couple of things you do and how you bring groups of veterans together and, and what 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 results come from that. 
Yeah, and I, and why I have you on how some of those guys came home and lived those long, treacherous lives, that's actually why I wrote Rifle 2. Yeah. Because Rifle 1 is, here's a big story about valor and everyone coming home being heroes, typical World War II book. Then Rifle 2 is a little bit more controversial about the individuals. And, you know, we'll talk about that. Um, but when Andrew sent that letter home about how much he enjoyed the, the M1 rifle, like I went out and bought an M1 rifle. Yeah, I just had to. I had to feel what he felt, hold what he held, connect with his long lost relative. And I'm going to explain how this connects to today's veterans. And I went out and bought a 1945 Winchester rifle and I took it to my regular family, my grandparents, my aunts, my uncles, a family dinner that night. And I said, look, and they just said, oh, it's, well, it's just a gun. It's a gun. What, you know, what do you do? And uh, I said, well, no, it's the rifle that Uncle Andy had when he when he died on that hill in Italy. Not the exact rifle, but the same kind. And it just kind of lost momentum um, of what the M1 meant to me and reading Andy's letter and connecting to this kid that had the same name as me. So um, I left, I came back to my house and a light bulb went over my head and I said, wait a minute, my neighbor had fought in the battle of Okinawa, Joe Drago, sixth Marine division, I company 22nd Marine regiment. I'll take this rifle to him. He'll appreciate it. He'll get it. And, um, I had originally been seeing Joe at some Marine Corps functions, Marine Corps birthday every year. Uh, the, the, when I, the last saw him, the healthiest I saw him was actually the premiere of the miniseries, the Pacific. They came mm -hmm. to Boston, did a showing. Joe was there. He was, you know, one of the first waves in Okinawa. He was wounded in action, um, um, on Sugarloaf Hill. So I bring him the rifle and now Joe's not this young guy. I saw drinking beers at all the, these functions. He's now, atrophied his legs are just as skinny as noodles he's in a recliner he's 92 i think at the time and i i guess I, this is when it hit me like we were in a race against time and i put yeah. the rifle into his hands and i said joe do you remember this and this little skinny guy who could barely keep his head up shoulders the m1 <laughs> smiling ear to ear like a psychopath like a typical marine corps psychopath <laughs> waving it around almost takes off my head but it's what happened in Paul in those last three hours that really drag what I do into with other younger veterans is he normalized combat. He find I finally didn't get the spoon fed greatest generation stuff from him because the first thing he said to me, he says, I can't believe that what they're doing to you guys for urinating on the dead Taliban. Right? So in 2011, a group of snipers mm -hmm. pissed on the dead Taliban uh, that group of snipers, by the way, had over like 200 kills, were killing IED makers. They were what you want on the battlefield. They were all up to silver stars, if not more. But someone leaked a video of them urinating on uh, a dead, dead, dead Taliban who had just blown up Marines just the day before. And he said, I can't believe you guys are even getting in trouble for that. Now, this is Joe from the 6th Marine Division, Okinawa. I can't believe there you guys are in trouble for that. That's nothing compared to what we used to do, right? And he goes, you know what? I want to give you something. This is a true story on my life and kids. I want to give you something. Go into my sock drawer. So I leave him with the M1 rifle. I go into his sock drawer, and I pull out a, a Crown Royal bag, the velvet Crown Royal bag that a Crown Royal comes in. And he goes, these are yours now. And it was a pile of Japanese gold teeth. He's like, I want you to have these. Love you, hell. So, and this is, I, I usually don't see these on other podcasts, but this is World War II TV and this is real and this is, this, it's, it's, it is what it is. And um, we talked about how war wasn't black and white. We talked about how the greatest generation did some not so great things. I mean, God, I mean, his, his recollection of, of accidentally killing civilians and maybe not caring about killing civilians so much on Okinawa. I went from being this Iraq Afghanistan vet where kind of keeping my head down because I don't I didn't serve in two popular wars to like, holy crap, like this guy just gave me the best therapy session yeah. ever. I f feel like I don't have to hide in the shadows of the greatest generation and neither should any other guy who wore the uniform to be like their great grandpas, or their grandfathers like. And I said, Joe, sign, sign your name on this rifle. I want to always remember this moment add your name to it. I can still tell you to this day of the 300 names on that, where he is. And he didn't even want to mark. He was such a Marine. He's like, I'm not going to mark up such a beautiful weapon, you know? And he signed it, Joe Drago. 
Okinawa, 6th Marine Division, I Company, 22nd Marine Regiment. And I left his house and I looked down at that signature of Paul and I said, not only because how his health was declining, I knew I was in a race against time. I said, I need to get as many signatures as possible. This was awesome. If I can teach the younger veterans how to live a successful life after combat through this rifle, this could be, this could work wonders. And I did it for five, six years collecting the names. And I'll let you talk for a second because then I'll tell you how like uh, the book came to fruition and how I ended up. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, there are foxholes with them in Europe. You know. Yeah, I mean, the, the trick, of course, is that you had that the the rifle became the conduit. It became the communication portal between you because we've all been seeing you know these worthy projects where schools or universities go and interview veterans. And they sit there with a clipboard or they sit the veteran behind a table or something, and they, they often start off very stilted because there's this there's a distance there's a barrier in fact, even the table if there's a table between you it's a it's a it creates a physical barrier but handing a veteran a rifle or a you know it could have been a hat it could have been a, a jacket a field jacket it could have been a musette bag whatever it would be <laughs> it's that thing that then connects isn't it, it becomes it becomes the the connection literally connecting as you pass it to him it connects to your hands through the rifle to his hands and it becomes the, the opening up of, of, of memories. And we'll, we'll talk about the rifle, the book in a minute, but you mentioned you know, the phrase greatest generation. I think since that was first coined, there's a certain warmth and fuzziness around it where I think people have forgotten or, or don't want to confront that the guys who served World War II went through some really bad shit, like the, the gold tooth story there. And it wasn't all liberation parades. It wasn't all local girls coming out and getting kisses on the cheek like when veterans come to real battlefields now they have a very positive experience generally coming whether they go to the pacific or vietnam veterans go back to vietnam wherever it would be the experiences is usually cathartic there's lots of a positive welcome for them etc etc but these guys are burdened with all sorts of stuff that they went through that are things that that they that were considered normal at the time then upon reflection became abnormal and then they closed them away in how many times have we do we know about these veterans that end up into a bottle or alcohol or inability to to relate to their families or they can't hold down jobs and, and that's the dark side of the greatest generation mm -hmm. it's the, mm -hmm. the, the most it's the burdened generation would be another way to describe it so that, that i just wanted to get that off my off my chest a little bit Absolutely. about the, the the glossiness of that word belies the, the horror some of what these men went through but we're at the point with Joe Drago you've got your first things and you went around there and then and then yeah tell us about the book yeah so um that was I left Joe's house I I said wow let's get a European theater guy now like you know like I was just so I called this guy John McAuliffe and this was like 2016 and John McAuliffe was the president of the Battle of the Bulge uh, association in Massachusetts, and I, I believe it, I corresponded with him as well. It's a small world, isn't it? Um, yeah, it is. And and the county was from began with W. What was the town? Worcester. 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 Yeah, yeah, that's yep. right. And so, John invites me to his fourteen-story project building, and and so in America we have the projects where people often refer to as the hood, the ghetto, the this, the that. Well, the truth is these projects and these low-income housing were built for returning veterans after World War II. That was the whole point of the projects. And as a veteran, you got first uh, dibs. You got to the front of the line for public housing. That's what – then when uh, the groups of veterans started to diminish, then they opened up to, you know, immigrants, uh, low-income housing, welfare, things like that. But John – here's John at age 98, the only World War II veteran in this 14 story condom uh, uh, project building, you know, uh, people from all different various backgrounds as I'm going up the elevator with this rifle in a case, right? <laughs> Coming into this uh, area of all these, you know, um, people. And I see this little battle of the bulge sticker on his door and I knock on his door and he had the meeting notes from every battle of the bulge meeting from the floor to the ceiling. Wow. He had outlived his spouse. He had no kids. And here I am with this rifle, and, and I was looking around his room, and I saw correspondence from guys like you, uh, Pascal, and over in Belgium, and um, he this this was a guy who stayed very active in the 87th Division Golden Acorn um, Association, and 
he he signs my rifle and then starts to connect me with his Rolodex of other veterans. You know, some of them. I mean, I, it was you know hit or miss if they were still alive. But next thing you know, he's giving me his his uh, overcoat, his Ike jacket, and his Nazi dagger, saying, you know, I don't know who I'm going to give this to. So now I'm starting to really see like have some of these guys just been waiting for me this whole time or like do they really realize they're at the end of their life and they and now they're presenting me with a gift and, and this guy doesn't even know me you know um i could be a, a scam artist and and there were there were times at first i would refuse gifts from any veterans being in law enforcement not taking advantage of the elderly and then i started to realize like some of the stuff started to end up in wrong hands some of the stuff ended up with people who didn't care about it they'd hawk it they'd take it to a pawn shop so now i take everything in my own little museum but John McAuliffe will fast forward. I think I decided to put pen to paper to actually write a book by my 19th signature was a man by the name of Clarence Cormier, 422nd Regiment, HQ, HQ Company, 106th Infantry Division, the Golden Lions. Um, everyone may not know this story. Some people get offended when we talk about their history. Somewhere between seven and 8,000 men surrendered at the Battle of the Bulge, one of the biggest surrenders since the American Revolu uh, American Civil War. Um, the, the numbers are disputed, but somewhere around 7,000, maybe more, had to surrender in and around St. Vith. Clarence was in country for two weeks. He gets off the boat, you know, in France. He's in Europe for two weeks. I mean, that actually counted as England time, too. So he... <laughs> He's in Europe for two weeks, and now he's a prisoner of war. Didn't get to fire a shot, nothing. Um, pretty devastating to your morale. He's uh, about 6'3", if not bigger. Big guy. Was a sergeant. Um, and here he is with the Mauser pointed in his face after all night long our artillery barrage. And now he's being forced on a boxcar, a train, destined for Germany, destined for a Stalag. Who knows? So all the guys from the 106th Infantry Division are... are stuffed into this train in in clarence at age 96 like i said this is only my 19th signature i'm not a writer i'm not a professional interviewer this is just me with an iphone on record and he starts to bawl his eyes out he's crying mm. i've never seen a six a 96 year old man cry i'm very taken back his daughter's in the room and i'm like do i stop do i and he starts telling me how Two American P-47s spot the train and start strafing the ever-loving hell out of it. They have no idea that there's all American POWs in there. He said the Germans, either the, the you know, the, the caboose or the uh, steam engine or whatever the hell it was got destroyed or the Germans stopped it. But he said the German himself opened the door to the boxcar to let the Americans out. They got on the ground and they formed the letters P-O-W with their human bodies. He said he could hear the engine of the P-47 coming in for another dive, and he was just gripping the hand of the other guy. And it bailed, the, the P-47 bailed out. And he said, I saw the, the pilot open his canopy, and he takes out his kerchief, and he starts waving it. He said, I the, felt like the plane was so close I could touch the plane. And he's crying his eyes out thinking about that, that last moment of freedom he had where he felt like he could touch this P-47. And... He goes on to go on this death march. You know, they march him all the way to the other side of Germany. The Russians take over a uh, Stalag. So then the Germans turn them around, march them all the way back. It was almost like a, the baton of Europe sort of thing. And because um, most of, and that's why he never enjoyed going to 106 Infantry Division Associations, because the main talk of all the monks, the men with each other was life in the Stalag, life in the Stalag. And Clarence never got to even see a Stalag. He lived under the stars the whole war, according to him. Mm. And he cried his eyes out. He signed my rifle. And I'm like kind of stunned in the hallway, like, because his daughter grabbed me and said, I always knew my father was a prisoner of war, but I've never heard my dad tell that story. Wow. And I said, if. Oh. I said, if his, sorry, oh. I said, if his own daughter doesn't know that story, how many people in this country don't know that story? Um. And I said, I got to do more than just collect a cool rifle with signatures from my man cave. Maybe I should write these guys' stories. And that spawned the book. I know that was a long story, but I think of Clarence. Well, Hoffman, I, story. In, and, uh, mm -hmm. and what's interesting, Andy, is that, you know, because 
I interview people from all sorts of backgrounds, very academic disciplines on this channel, people who are popular authors. You know, I interview fellow, fellow podcasters, tour guides, people who've just had a hobby researching a unit. In the case of the rifle, and, and I'm, the, I'm one of the people, like everybody else, who in, enjoyed reading it. And and yet, you know, because we've exchanged a few messages where you, you, you check out veterans and what they were saying, because you're being told these stories. You're connecting with these veterans on this incredible level where you're helping them. The, in, you know, the, the daughter in this case is, is understanding her father's experience. And wh when did you feel or do you feel obliged to then check the, the stories out and to compare things? Because th there's a value in, in a veteran telling a story, even if the story has morphed over the years to be something it wasn't quite was. Because... You're not trying to explain people with the rifle. This is how these units progressed through Europe. This is what they were doing on certain days. It's not that you can get that from regimental histories and divisional history. You're trying to explain what these guys went through and how they related it to you and how it came through the rifle. So how, how did you address that situation of, of, of um, cross-checking things? Oh, my Lord. Well, just like everyone, I don't care who you are and what level of historian, tour guide, we've all been burned. We've all been burned. <laughs> oh, yes. oh, yes. And it took me to get burned. It took me to get burned to actually start hitting the National Archives. Um, luckily, I was a director of veteran services in the town of Saugus, Massachusetts, before I became a police officer. And I had access. If you enlisted from Massachusetts, I actually got to have access to your DD-214. So that helped me out a lot. However, some guys had their records burned in that famous fire at St. Louis. Um, other guys did jump the border from Canada and join the military here. Mm -hmm. in, um, in, a, in America, we saw a lot of that. Um, but yeah, it took me to get burned. And that's the other thing. I, I, you know, I know I, Rifle One is such an important, awesome book to relate uh, on how to live a successful life after combat. And a lot of stories people haven't heard. But Rifle Two, I covered the alcoholics, the liars, the murderers, the jailbirds, uh, the suicidal veterans, um, yeah. the not so great, the domestic disturbances, things, things like that. And um, I covered one case about one of the best liars I ever met. And being I was a detective for the last uh, year and a half in narcotics. I'm back on patrol now. I have a different job in a different neighborhood but um i thought i considered myself a good bullshit artist you know of, of being able to read people um so it, it starts it started with um i mean there's various various guys on the level they lie some guys will, will lie on how much combat they actually saw other guys will entirely lie about what division they were and other guys will lie about even stepping foot in france or belgium or germany um i one time i drove like three and a half four hours to interview this guy who's supposed to be a ball turret gunner with the 96 bomb group and flew this many missions and he's got his whole all the great grandkids in the living room, the the parent, the, oh. his kids, the great, the regular grandkids, the neighbor. This guy's coming to have me sign his rifle today, and he's telling me all these stories. And of course, I go and I pull like I think the '96 bomb group um, flight rosters, and you know I can't find this guy's name <laughs> anywhere. And then I finally find him, and you know. Um, he, he was a mechanic in England, never left, never left the airfield in, in England, which is a notable, honorable job. Exactly. Yeah. You're, you're keeping those B-17s flying, buddy. Like you are a World War II veteran. I, you're someone who I would totally bring back to Europe, but yeah. he needed to be this ball turret gunner that shot down a bunch of ME-109s. Um, and I think about, he's probably been telling that lie for the last 75 years. Um, there's no point of exposing him, embarrassing him or his family, but just everybody wanted to be a hero back then. So the, the American government says there's 16 million uh, veterans who earned the World War II Victory Medal. That's how they yep. that's what they classify World War II veterans. That could be uh, 1941 to 47, I think. Occupation duty, you got the World War II Victory Medal. And so the ones that saw combat, actual combat, are very, very much smaller. Um, and... Back then, it was nobody asked because everybody was a veteran. The, the, the police officer was a veteran. Your local politician was a veteran. The mayor was a veteran. Your doctor was a veteran. The lawyer was a veteran. Everybody was a veteran back then. The guy kicking, you know, I always talk to the Vietnam vets, and they just seemed like everybody's parents were World War II vets. And 
I think it started to get a little out of hand. So, you know, that's a guy whose name I left on the rifle. Sure, he lied about what he did, but he was still a World War II veteran. But one time, you know, I started answering all these social media requests. Oh, my neighbor was in the Battle of the Bulge. He was shot in the face. You had to come see him. I run over there with the rifle. I have him sign the rifle. And I'm like, oh, how old are you? And he's like, oh, 89. And I'm like, uh, 89. Uh, seems like he's a few years off. Oh, what division were you with? Uh, uh, the 28th? Uh, okay. Um, and then I, I pull his records and, you know, he was in the army band in 1948 and he played the tuba. He wasn't with the, (laughs) he wasn't with the 28th division getting shot in the face in the battle of the bulge, you know? And, uh, so then I really had to get serious about, uh, but I, I write about an amazing, amazing liar in, and I change his name in, in rifle two, um, because it's no, it's not no point of embarrassing him, him or his, his family. And he's long, he's passed away now. And, um, He's someone who was so goddamn good at lying. I mean, he, this guy went to anniversaries and reunions that I can find since the 70s, uh, being with a particular division. He's in photos from these reunions. Uh, his name is in published books as being with this. And I finally got the nitty gritty. I had to go to the Rhode Island Veteran Service Office, get original documents and prove that he was never with that particular division. And, um, but like, I, I can see why he lied. You know, um, we talk about the guys that came home a little screwed up and, and so even though I cut all ties with him, um, I do forgive him now that he's in heaven and he could have ruined me as an author, as a historian, as of whatever, because I actually happened to go overseas with this guy and, um, but he he was so damn good. He he just lied about being with such an obscure unit that it was so hard to prove. But that mm. unit happened to be attached to one of the most famous divisions, the hundred and first. And it's funny because I've, I've for a long time I've been thinking about doing a, a, a series of shows or at least a show looking at how these veterans construct these stories because I don't think they be. I don't. It doesn't start with a big lie. I think it's a mm-hmm. gradual the snowball rolls. You know, they start off. Yes, I served in World War Two, and then they start adding in recognizable phrases that the audience will listen to D-Day, Battle of the Bulge, 8th Air Force, whatever it be. And, they, and the story takes on its power, uh, its power. And, you know, I look through my collection of World War II books and some signed by veterans and I'll pull one out. And amongst the, the genuine signatures I now know are these guys who signed it, who weren't, who they said they were. And they would obviously look at my book and look at the other names in there and go, yep, yeah, fine, sign it. And, and they must have known that they weren't, they weren't, who they say they were and they would you know you they would take my thank you and handshakes and it, it's an extraordinary thing but for all that and we've all been you know people are saying in the side we've all been bitten every historian of every country has has, has all got a, a story the, the great majority of people you meet are are, are are telling the truth and certainly they're telling the emotional truth and i think that's the thing that comes across with the with the rifle one and i shall get rifle two at some point is is that if Someone may, a veteran may misremember the date of a battle or we misremember which German unit they were facing or something. But if they describe what it was like in a, in a foxhole when 88s open up on them, maybe it wasn't 88s, maybe it was a different type of gun. Their experience of that visceral sounds of things exploding mm-hmm. around. And if they tell you about their friend dying, that's emotional truth, even if some of the dates are off. So, you yeah, know, you, you Tiger know Tank versus situations. Panzer Tank. You always see that one too. Like, yeah, uh, every yeah. tank was a Tiger Tank, you know? So, yeah. So, so, so tell us about some of the things. We'll go back to the question about um, bringing World War II veterans with veterans of other units and some of your trips to Europe because. We we are gonna we, we are gonna be rapidly closing that door on the World War II generation, but we're not gonna be closing the door on on using World War II and using the connections, foundations and things have done to keep on going. I mean, it would be a shame if all these worthy organizations just just stopped. There are there are veterans of other wars, there are veterans of of, of other of you know, not even just from, from the military, but police veterans and, and, and who 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 have issues that can be helped by the same people who do the work. So tell us about, about how you think it's going to evolve as the World War II window closes. <sighs> um, you know, uh, when I sat in front of 300, 300, right, 301, 302 different World War II veterans, a, a common um, 70%, the 70 percentile was they, they never been back to where they served. Yeah. So how, how does Paris, Rome, 
Amsterdam, right? The big cities that are in places like our bucket list for Americans. And in Boston, it's a direct flight, six hours, Boston to Paris, Boston to Amsterdam, Boston to Rome. Why have these men never been back? What what happened there that was so terrible? Um, and I think a lot of them, to, to have their longevity, they moved on with their life. One, one thing I've seen that veterans have gotten to their 90s is they quit the drink and they quit the smoke and, and they kept so busy. So they had not just one career, but they retired from a job, got a second job. They had kids. They had grandkids. That is the common consistency I've seen. They stayed active in the associations. It was... Um, and I'm going to get into the actual, how I see the future looking, but it was 2019. I had taken my first veteran back, uh, solo. And in 2019, I asked, I met a, a gentleman by the name of Al Bucciarelli, who served with the third infantry division, 15th regiment headquarters company. He had his leg blown off outside the town of Mangano, which is like 30 minutes from Monte Cassino. And he had never been back to Italy where he lost his leg. <clears throat> and I said, would, would you go now? Would, would you ever go back to Italy? And he said, well, now I probably would, you know? And I said, well, why don't we go back? Why don't we go back? Cause I had a friend who lost his leg in Fallujah, Brian Johnson. I said, why don't me, you and Brian go back to Italy where you lost his le your leg? It's a, it's a first world country. It's, we can get nice hotels. It's, and to, to watch the two of them, watch Brian, who lost his leg in Fallujah, who's probably asking himself, what's my future going to look like? To be next to 95-year-old Al Bucciarelli, who lost his leg, and the two of them together at Rome National Cemetery with their prosthetic legs looking at the graves. How that isn't on the cover of Time magazine, I, I don't know. Because <clears throat> here they were bonding. And, and I remember Al saying to Brian, like, I didn't want to give up, Brian. Are you going to give up? And Brian saying, no, no, Al, I'm not going to give up. And because it was always like, wow, you've been walking on a prosthetic leg for 75 years. And wow, this was so hard. You've seen everything from wooden prosthetic legs to plastic to aluminum, Al, you know, aluminum. And and he looked at Brian and said, yeah, I was never going to give give up. Right, right, Brian? Like, and he mm -hmm. delivered that message to my buddy Brian. And um, it that became an ejection and an addiction for me to start bringing more World War II veterans back. So that was just Italy, right? So then when I bring them back to Belgium and France and I see it looks like I'm coming back with the Beatles, you know, and everyone's on the sidewalks and clapping, then it's like uh, addiction overlord. Then I start reaching out to other young veterans and pairing them together, and it just became so amazing. And then we're putting up memorials and monuments. But fast-forwarding and getting to where we see this is going to be, in, in America – if you talk about the Civil War, World War One, or the Revolutionary War, you might as well be talking about dinosaurs. <laughs> it's the truth. You, these kids, and including myself, we sit there and we yawn when we see black and white photos in our history books. Because the living veteran is not next to you and not in your presence or having a coffee at the coffee shop, it might as well have happened a million years ago. That's just... So, after the 80th anniversary, we are obviously going to... The, the 80th anniversary will be the last big anniversary with this many living World War II And we said that about the 70th and the 75th, but it, I mean, the, absolute, the 80th absolutely is going it to is. be. People do down. not live in, routinely into their 110s. So, no, so, no. You know, the, yeah, the Best Defense Foundation, MAG is getting ready right now to work with them. The average age of their 43 veterans, I think, is 102 this year, which is absolutely amazing. But by if next were, year, yeah, if you were a replacement, you'd be about 97 or 98 right now. That's the uh, minimum, uh, yeah. So it's, yeah, you if, know. You, if you were there for the Rhine, like I'm saying, Europe, Europe, the youngest veterans we have that actually saw combat are, are going to be the Okinawa campaign guys because that was yeah. 1945, April 1st. But if you were in Europe you and you were crossing the Rhine after the Battle of Bulge, then you'd be the, the 1926, born 1926 group. But uh, that doesn't mean they're they're alive. Those guys came home and chain smoked cigarettes, you know. So I, I'm a I'm a little worried of where it's gonna go after the 80th anniversary. However, I think because World War II happened in the motion picture ages, where and the living veterans are around for YouTube pages, mm -hmm. right? So you have mm -hmm. Band of Brothers, Saving Private Ryan. You have World War II TV. You have the Rifle Instagram page. You have the iPhone. I think this is the most documentation yeah, of true. a conflict. 
which will give World War II interest, awareness, more longevity. Um, however, for those on social media, we're watching tank duels in Ukraine right now. We're watching drones dropping grenades. I mean, this is beyond me. I'm a dinosaur now, right? Yeah, uh, I carried yeah. the M16. <laughs> I carried the I was M16 reading a thread on Twitter Ukraine. yesterday about it was advice to fellow history uh, professors of history to stop making Rambo jokes in class because today's kids don't understand Rambo jokes because Rambo is 1990s. You have to be our age and up. To, so, and they'll think, oh my God, if Rambo is old fashioned, what is World War II? What is growing up watching movies like I did that were made in the 1950s with John, you know, Alan Allport was talking about the fact his students haven't heard of John Wayne. And I'm like, what, what, did, what did you mean you haven't heard of John Wayne? But I'm a, I'm a dinosaur, of course, I, you yeah. know, so... It, 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 we're in an era where, as I say, that history is is a is a pop hit from ten years ago. Mm -hmm. And I think, and um, I I was I think I think well, I think Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks are coming out with a new miniseries called Masters of the Sky or Masters yeah. of the Air. I think that's going to give some longevity to the interest of World War II. Um, so I, I think these HBO documentaries, I think these books, uh, I think that has helped carry World War II big time. But it's like almost, it's a double-edged sword. I feel like on my Instagram page, I have followers from age 15 to Vietnam War. And I have their parents sometimes messaging me saying, my kid loves your Instagram page. He's learning more on your Instagram page than he does in high school. And, and they're not lying because I remember World War II history in my high school class was the attack on Pearl Harbor dropping the atomic bombs and that was about it and it was like two pages on world war ii and so to, for them for these 15 year olds 16 year olds and 17 year olds to me messaging my instagram page it does give me hope that mm. people are still interested in world war ii and and whenever i put out a challenge like let's say there's a dog tag found in europe or i found a canteen cover uh a, the other day uh when i was in belgium i bought an uh, engraved canteen cover off out of, out of the back of a guy's trunk and i put his name on Instagram and I said the first person to find me a living family member is going to get you know a free giveaway and these little 15 16 17 year old kids who are on Instagram are just come up with a plethora of information and so the fact that they took that challenge seriously and like that gives me hope that people are still interested in the World War II interest will be uh existing beyond the living veterans part but I think the living the living veterans part are keeping it alive because here in America almost nightly on the news you see Private Joe Smith turned 100 years old today, and it's his 100th birthday. And so, like, these 100-year-old birthday things are, like, the new thing on the news, keeping um, World War II veterans' um, awareness going. But the, the elephant in the room, though, that we're not talking about is that we kind of hinted at it earlier, is World War II is the good war, isn't it? It's the, it's the good against evil. We defeat the Third Reich, the, the Japanese Empire that were murdering their way across the world. You know, we, 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 we ended the Holocaust, etc. I say we, the, the generation, it did all that. The wars since are not as black and white. And let's not got to go into the, the, the whys and, and where. Of course, the experience, your two buddies you took to Italy, their experience was exactly the same. Whether or not the war was was... Um, the public were behind it or not, whether it was a war on terrorism, whether it was a proper a, a big war, a small war, it doesn't that doesn't make any difference. The experiences of those who are in them are you are are you are the same. You know, if if your leg is blown off in Antietam, it's the same as it being blown off in Fallujah. The the, the experience, the the, the, medi the medical science has improved, but yeah. the experience of dealing with it is is going to be pretty much exactly the same. So how how are well you know the Vietnam veterans are now the age of the World War II, but well, they're now older. The older Vietnam veterans are now older than the first World War II veterans I knew. So how are we going to cross that bridge of being able to get the, the public behind supporting veterans and listening to veterans in wars that weren't as easy to categorize as World War II? Uh, uh, Paul, I mean, I'm nervous. I'm scared, man. Um, uh, uh, I definitely see Vietnam making some, I'm not going to say a comeback because that's just terrible to say that, but I see Vietnam peaking in interest. I, I think I went to the show of shows this year in Kentucky, and there was a crap ton of Vietnam stuff. People were buying Vietnam helmets, Vietnam this. And so I see something, I see momentum carrying here. Um, but Christ, it's taken to them to be almost 80 years old for us to uh, respect and be interested in, in their war, you know. 
and I, and and I'm I'm gonna drop this bomb on your show because I know it's gonna come eventually, and I've already gotten a little bit of shrapnel for it. We as post 9-11 veterans and Vietnam veterans, we threw that uniform on, not because, oh, well, I believe in the war in Iraq or I believe in Vietnam. It's We wanted to be like our grandfathers. We wanted to be like our great grandfathers, wear that same uniform. And hopefully our government was being honest on why we deployed somewhere or why we're fighting, right? So I believed everything my country said. I remember being in eighth grade and watching people jump from the Twin Towers in my childhood being robbed for me on live TV. Some kid who I used to be into Pokemon cards and WWE wrestling. Now I'm watching Twin Towers burning and people jumping out. Totally. I was watching CNN until I graduated high school to be able to join the Marines and serve my country and hopefully get a chance to fight the Taliban, def- destroy Al Qaeda. It was our Pearl Harbor. Yeah. And oh boy. And then uh, a year and a half ago, maybe it's coming up on two years ago, watching the fall of Afghanistan, I became a Vietnam veteran overnight, just like that. Boom. How do we go from winning? And I am, you know, not to get into all of it, but um, how do we go from winning every battle to losing the war? And I finally started to look in the mirror and say, wow, was my country not honest with me? Was this never going to work? Should we have been out of Afghanistan in 2011? Was I lied to? Was Then I started thinking about, the German army, right? And, and yeah, th- those guys who, well, first of all, they didn't have a choice, right? So, but the guys that wore the uniform because they believe in a leader or they believe in their country. And that's actually why I asked a German veteran to write a forward in my, in rifle two, right? So I already said rifle two is full of the not so greatest generation lot, you know? And I said, you know what, why don't I give a voice to a German veteran who's willing to talk, willing to maybe even apologize, willing to see what his two cents are. And I asked um, a guy from the second Panzer SS Panzer Division to write the forward. And um, the second SS Panzer Division were absolute bastards. They did some crazy war crimes. Yeah, he was no, a re- no way he was, denying it. Yep. Yeah, he was a replacement during the Battle of the Bulge, um, but he still served shoulder to shoulder with those guys. But I wanted to know, as a young, as a veteran of Iraq and Afghanistan, having marched into countries because my country said it was a good idea and I believed it and I thought I was doing the right thing is that naturally we didn't murder civilians, but was there some sort of, uh, similarities? What, what were they lied about? Why not give them a voice? It's been 78 years. And most importantly, most importantly, the American world war II veterans have always wanted to meet these guys when they come back to shake their hands, to say sorry. So who am I? Who am I to say, no, screw you. You go hide in the shadows. Every American veteran I ever put on a plane, I said, if one of you guys votes no, we're not going to have lunch with this uh, Tiger Tank commander. We're not going to have lunch with this guy from the Panzer SS Panzer Division. We're not going to have lunch with this guy from a Volks Grenadier Battalion. Do you guys, they want to meet their former enemy, make peace. Are you guys up for it? And every American veteran has stood up and said, absolutely. Absolutely. Because I remember I had Bud Heidecke from the 492nd Heavy Bomb Group go up to the gentleman from the SS and he said, I am ashamed of the bombings we did in Germany. Um, I am actually of German descent to know that I was setting actually probably my own relatives on fire in some of those cities. And he's saying this to a guy from the second SS Panzer division and the guy from the second SS, SS Panzer division is sitting there saying, I apologize too. I've, I've, I regret that we ever went to war in America. I have owned American companies and I'm so glad. And the, this was the first American veterans he ever met the S the second SS Panzer guy. So for him to, you know, openly say, I don't have the same views I had before and wanting to meet each other. I thought it would be decent to give him, um, something to say in a forward now that I know what it's like to be fucking lied to. Excuse my language. I mean, no, I, I say fuck every now and then. I mean, this is, mm. we're back at this, the heart of it again is the, is the glossiness of, of how sometimes the greatest generation is perceived and, 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 and wars are dirty. Wars are horrible. And you know, that you can, people can be questioning why the U S got in, well, and the Britain as well got involved in recent wars, but you know, this, the same kind of questions are also raised about some of the campaigns in world war two in that historians will now say, Oh, did we need to bother with the hurt gun forest campaign? Did we need to bother pushing a core up to Cherbourg when the harbor was already there? 
perhaps we should have been better doing this. Maybe we should have done that. They're great and interesting conversation to have as historians about, about the use of resources. But if you were from son of, son of a bitch from Minnesota or some kid from Sydney, Australia, fighting in some hellhole in the world, you had no um, influence in the, the, how your unit was sent there and what the motivations were and what the aims of that were. All you're doing is going through an experience. And, and, and yes, when we get into SS, there's a little bit of a different because there's also a personal allegiance some of these guys signed up to to, to, be, to be a murdering arsehole. But, but in terms of where you serve and what you did, most people didn't have any choice at all. And it's it, it, confronting difficult conversations is important, isn't it? So you, you've had them because when you were out there in, in Germany with, with the, the Das Right guy, because JD, who was with you there, was messaging me saying, should I put this guy on video? Would I put it on my mind? It's complicated because yeah. you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. If you if you give airtime to a Das Right veteran, some people will say, how dare you? Yep. And other people will say, oh, what interesting to hear someone else's point of view. It's a very, very complicated situation, as is, as is, you know, even meet them in the first place. So, yeah, we're, well, it's a, it's a fascinating conversation. Um, um, what, what was the takeaway when you're driving back or on, on waiting for you know, the airport to go back? Was meeting the German veteran one of the, the, the key things for these guys, their takeaway from that trip? What was that something that we're still talking about? Yeah, and I, and or else I would have said scrap the second SS Panzer idea. Um, um, definitely, it was like I said when I saw Bud Heidecke, who who uh, whose you know grandparents came from Germany to America, and now he's back over the skies of Germany, dropping payloads of bombs every every mission, and him have, grabbing the SS Panzer Division guy's hand and saying sorry and. Um, I guess it, they didn't care what division they guys were for, what they did, because right, every German veteran is painted bad. Uh, if if you don't know what you're talking about, like you or or me, you know, when you talk about mainstream media, uh, you were the big bad evil German army. Um, and you know, I look at I look at if if someone wanted to write about Andrew Biggio in a book about Afghanistan and a Taliban guy we wrote the forward would i recant and not have anything doing and the answer would be no um even isis al-qaeda they're just as bad as the second ss you know as far as mm -hmm. murdering people uh, butchering people um and um they don't deserve to be forgiven at all and i think that what was good about the second ss guys he got to put what he wanted to say in writing and i played god with what it was going to be shown to the public so I got to say, like, is he trying to deliver a message of hate? Is he trying to deliver a message that he doesn't care? But no, it was actually a message of an apology and m about meeting American veterans for the first time since the war. Um, and so I, I said, you know, what? we're going to go with it. You know, we're going to we're going to go with it. Um, I'm feeling a certain kind of way of knowing what those guys feel like in in a way of how they their service and um the war, you know, the, what the uniform became to them after the war. And so I, I just went with it. And, um, and the other reason why I went with it was because I only had about five German veterans who, um, their cognitive abilities weren't able to let them write the forward. I, I, I had become friends with, uh, Jurgen Tegatov, who a lot of people know who were with the, um, heavy tank battalions in, um, in Bastogne, but he has since severely declined. He would have been my first go-to um to write a forward but you know what dr fempel ended up working all right and and so um that's that so so you know we're, let's bring it back to this how we're all going to push forward i mean you know i i've never on this channel particularly interviewed world war ii veterans a couple have come along here and there but it's been about dealing with historians and, and their views but there are people you know foundations who have, have spent the last 10 years documenting world war ii veterans taking world war ii veterans on tours and and all the positives and uh, associated with that, and okay, as we said, that era is going to is going to come to an end. But the future, in terms of how we how we use World War II, how we connect veterans, is, is going to be down to people like yourselves and the other mutual friends we have in Europe and the US and Britain who who are undertaking these projects and th and they are involving difficult conversations because it's not easy. So going back to what I said at the beginning, it's fairly easy for someone to go and lay a flower at a cemetery, to go there, pay some respects, not not nod, take their hat off, attend you know, a ceremony. But dealing with living veterans of different wars, their, their problems are 
multitudes, they're, they're, they're the ways of, of reaching through these people are different. What works for one veteran doesn't work for another. One of my best friends who was out in, 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 blown up uh, on an IED, um, it, it, he he uses art. He's his, he's his main thing. He draws. Uh, that was his big therapy. Well, he didn't draw before he went into the military, but he now draws, and that's one of his big cathartic processes. And he's involved in model making with other veterans. They they sit around and they they paint up aircraft, and and, and that yeah, works cool. for him. It doesn't work for his some of his his friends. So. We, I think we all have some very difficult um, years ahead of us because it's been, it's been easy in a sense with the World War II veterans as being as being the focus, and without them it'll be a lot a lot harder. So, what what are your what are your hopes and plans for the future? I mean, you know, the years you're not here normally this year. What 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 do you, what what are the next two or three years going to bring for you? So that's why I put up the 17th Airborne Monument in Germany, right? So I said. Um, they didn't, they didn't have a memorial or a monument anywhere near, uh, uh, Basel, Germany. I mean, this was operation varsity. They took 2000 casualties in Normandy. You can't go 10 feet without walking into a airborne monument. The 17th deserves, uh, deserves a monument. So I took on that project to give some more longevity, get some younger veterans involved. Hey man, I know you were in the 82nd in Iraq or Afghanistan. You want to come help me put up a monument in, in Germany to, to keep this going then we on the 77th anniversary of operation varsity we had i think eight world war ii veterans with us six of them that were in the 17th airborne who were there at varsity we unveiled the monument um so now okay think about what you want to do Vigio, for the 80th what younger veterans do you want to come up should we put up another memorial a monument is there an, a forgotten division a forgotten regiment how can we create a facebook event keep the momentum going get bodies there to show up um obviously the living world war ii veteran is the main recipe we'll see when we get there when it comes to the 80th anniversary so i i took off the 79th anniversary to prepare for 80th bathstone 80th normandy uh, i think i'm going to do something nice to the 10th armored division in, in bastone um a lot of people don't know they were in the boy jack with yeah. the uh, 101st airborne too because uh, everybody was trapped there together um i put up the fourth id memorial in the hurricane forest with jake ruser who was a medic with the 12th regiment um so I, i'm i'm i think we need to be clever on what we're gonna do not just like you said put the flower down ring a bell ding 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 some taps and everyone goes home i think we gotta get up to date clever what's gonna be trendy on social media what's gonna um go viral what's going to be good. Um, we put Ed Cottrell, I put Ed Cottrell back at a P40, uh, no, excuse me, a T6 Texan. And we took off from his old runway. Like, uh, I know these are some difficult things, but I think we, all of us are clever, smart enough to be able to do this, to make it to the 85th anniversary, whether we have a living veteran or not, yeah. but to be, to be at that monument and memorial, that beach and say, remember when so-and-so was here. Remember when we did that. What you're saying is, is that memorials in the future won't just be a stone construct. They will be something that's living and breathing. You know, I mean, uh, when sometimes the money comes out of how much monuments cost, I'm, think, I'm thinking as great as they are, what about creating, you know, some kind of online portal community? You know, I mean, there's a veterans project I know about or a history project where, they're sending the the, do, the the daughter or son of of the project person around with a camera to do five minute TikToks and two minute well whatever one minute TikToks Instagram who who who've coming at this with no no knowledge of World War Two at all and just what they are getting out of it and that that to me is a fantastic because presumably that will reach other sixteen and seventeen year olds yeah. who have no knowledge of World War Two yeah. and and because I get I get. The percentage of viewers on World War Two TV who are under twenty is is pretty much zero. Everybody is my age, and 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 a few outside of that demographic. So I'm not reaching seventeen year olds, uh, but there are me me means of visit uh, of reaching seventeen year olds and eighteen year olds around the world of different nations, and getting people. You know, you mentioned what's happening in Ukraine. There are going to be hopefully projects in the future where kids from Iraq, kids from Afghanistan, kids from the USA, from Britain, from the Falkland Islands, from Australia, from Ukraine can engage and talk and talk about the past and use it as some kind of friendship memorial. I mean, I'm just kind of spitballing here, but I think that's yeah. where we've got to go from the, just the 
you know, books are fantastic. Memorials are fantastic. But the kids would say it's old school. Yeah. And I and I want to just it, it's an attention span thing. You know that I know that I think when those 15, 16, 17 year olds get a little bit older, they will be watching World War Two TV. But right now we have to catch them with that Instagram, that TikTok. Uh it's a necessary evil if we want uh, history to stay alive. And you know what? You reminded me of when you mentioned Iraq. When I went and I took Bob White from the 507th Parachute Infantry back to Vasil for the first time, we put him back on his drop zone again. One of my greatest memories of my life. I went back to the hotel and there was probably seven or eight of us who had served in Iraq and Afghanistan having beers in the lobby. Um, later that night, the World War II veterans went to bed. We're all reminiscent about the day. And this kid comes up to me and he says, hey, um, and, and this kid was Middle Eastern looking. And he said, am I, am I, did I hear it correctly? Did you guys are, serve in Iraq? And I said, yeah. He said, I'm Kurdish. Um, do you mind if I have a photo with all of you guys? Wow. And I said, wow. He, here we were in France, Belgium, and Germany, where all the focus was on the World War II guys, which was awesome. That's still a form of therapy for us to, to see how thankful people are for American veterans. But here's this Kurdish kid in the lobby of a German hotel who just overheard us talking and now wants a photo with all of us. And of course, you know, that goes right back to social media. He starts following the rifle page. He starts seeing mm -hmm. everything else we're doing. Then it just kind of blossoms. So yeah, ha has social media become a virtual memorial in itself? It has. I think that's a yeah, no, I mean, and that, you know, and you, I'm going to bring you back to what you said earlier about the, the the other wars, the civil war, revolutionary war, being being you know, so far in the past, might as well be dinosaurs. The fact is, is that apartment buildings across the USA, complexes across Europe, in France and Britain, there are probably students who are being forced to study events that we live through, you know, the Iraq war, 9-11, it says 9-11 is being taught in classrooms now. It, it, to me, it feels mm. still very fresh, still very recent, but it, it, almost like it's the, the news, but it is now, it's now part of history. But those yeah. people and kids who are reading about that, that they may be literally going up in an elevator to where they live in an apartment with someone who was in, involved in that or was serving at the time or was in one of the towers or or they may be honking their horn on their car at a Vietnam vet who's who's dawdling at the traffic lights while they're studying it in 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 school. So it's about remi reminding people that the war may be over, but the people who live through that are still there, and the people who are scarred by it. In you know, you know, with with writing the rifle one and two, is that. Even the veterans who signed the rifle who've passed away, their families, their children, their grandkids may have got something out of that whole experience, which is keeping their story going on. They've now got a book on their shelf that is now a, 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 a version of, of granddad or father's story to, to keep on. So just because the veterans have passed away doesn't mean the legacy has ended. It just means it's transferring to different generations. A absolutely and i have <laughs> the kids hit me up on their instagram page like I, I i don't know if you were the guy who brought a rifle to my grandfather five years ago he's passed away i said yeah that was me that was i remember your grandfather he's like he never talked about it do you have any audio or video i'm like absolutely here it is uh here's what he did i had a kid said uh said to me hey man i just graduated marine corps boot camp my grandfather was in okinawa and i'm like i know exactly who your grandfather is he was this gentleman and, and so it's already doing that it's already playing that and you brought up something that i thought was interesting and i already i forgot what i was going to say but um yeah you know um it's uh, i am so grateful for the short i was born in 1987 i didn't have all the, a lot of time many of the other historians i've run into have had with since the 80s and 70s with these world war ii veterans to get um awesome awesome uh intel awesome interviews i had to go if i was going to interview a world war ii veteran in boston massachusetts who was with the sixth marine division in a certain regiment that means i might have to fly to bend oregon just to get a second point of view of a guy who was there you know all the way across the country when they were they, there was a day you could get guys from the same division who lived on the same street in america yeah. and um so that's why i did my book in short stories rather than trying to do a whole regimental history of particular guys i think the most guys i met still living which was like about 20 of them from the 87th division 
John McAuliffe's division. And that mm-hmm. was, I had never intended, never cared about the 87th division, never even heard of them, but yet accidentally getting 20 names on the rifle from the same division was huge in 2020, 2019. And so uh, I had really fun with that, with that division, the golden acorns. Well, I think we will bring things to an end and then we can just reconvene at some point and carry on this conversation because it's, it's been really rewarding. And um, there are no easy answers in terms of how history is going to be recorded. And, and, and this is a, this is a means of, of history for some people. So, for those, I mean, there's already people in the sidebar saying how they've enjoyed the book, but for those who are more of the, the consumers of, of of hardcore battlefield studies on World War II TV, what what would what would be your your sales pitch for the rifle one and two in terms of what what people can get out of it? <sighs> I think it's the first time you'll see America's newest generation of veterans saying goodbye to the oldest generation of veterans. Um, I, I often see pictures of Spanish American War veterans meeting World War II veterans or uh, World War One veterans and meeting Desert Storm veterans. These photos, I think, are just so historic. And we always talk about history in America by, uh, oh, what war was going on during that time? Was that before 9-11 or after 9-11? Was that before COVID or after COVID? Was that during World? And I think this really uh, is a very great story about um, the bonding of, of one veteran seeking to know the answers to the future by consulting with the older veterans. And then that war isn't always black and white and and stuff like that. And um, so it's not your your typical World War II book. I did as best as I could in the year I was given um, after my own military service. And um, and thank you for giving me a platform, Paul. No, thank you. And as I said, what I liked about the run, I have to get the rifle too, is, is that it's very much your journey, as you said there, as well as the veterans. Some historians, when they're doing the book, are trying to keep themselves out of the book. It's about the history. The his, you know, the, the author is a is a is a, a provider of the information, but the author's not there to give a to, to, to be part of the of the learning process. But in, in terms of the rifle, it is it is as much your journey as you said there in dealing with coming back from a war and how it how you were facing um, survivors guild, as you said, and 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 the prospect of of turning your service to a different type of career and what you were going to do with it and where you're going with it now. So that's, I I have to say, I think this is a compliment to people. I move your book around on my bookshelf. I don't quite know where to put it because it, it covers. So there there were some books. Yeah. That's Pacific war. That's naval history that goes on. Yours kind of moves around because it's. I've seen your your third row. It says rubbish. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's definitely not. But I know it's sometimes it kind of goes with the people who examine kind of the reasons why people fight. Then it it kind of goes again, kind of with the, with, with veterans. It it moves around. I would would never ever refer my book to anyone as a unit history or anything like that. Mine's at first person account um type stuff um i i just i got i got in the, the game too late to to write a unit history type book you yeah. know um and it's been done and so and it's been mm-hmm. done and, it, and it'll be yeah. been, there are there are great people like john mcmanus and 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 you know peter caddick adams and james Holland, all mm-hmm. these but who are writing campaign histories there and there are others who are who are obsessive about a particular unit and giving us a fantastic well james sure. Fenlon did his fantastic 11 fairborn book recently but yours is a is a is a is a buffet style of, uh, of of veterans and how they came back from a war and how and how they found it easy or not easy talking to you about it and you talking it to, to them. So, um, well, yeah, the links to your website in the description below, your various projects. We could, there's lots more things we haven't talked about. But we can talk, reconvene and talk about more experience to bringing your vets back and we can work on, on some things for the 80th anniversary, but you're always Absolutely. welcome here and, and folks, if you haven't got the books, go and get them and check out Andy's website. So um, hopefully, folks, well, I'm definitely back tomorrow with Lucy, but not on World War One TV. So if you're not yet a subscriber to World War One TV, tomorrow's show is going to be on that channel, though I will do a five minute little live thing here to tell you all to go to World War One TV. But Lucy and I are doing an ask me anything or ask us anything about our history interest and also World War One TV. So that's tomorrow night. And hopefully there'll be a show on Friday. Uh, but I, I've got to confirm in my guest, but it's, um, we'll, we'll, we'll see. But anyway, thank you, Andy. Thank you, viewers. It's Paul Widow for World War II TV saying I will see you all again next time. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Thank Bye. you.